At this time, we're going to move into our family altar time, but right before we get there, Barb's coming. She's already here. I love to surprise people. Uh, some of you have taken out missionary books, and if you have, our little friend, would you stand, please, little lady? This is Val. She's been looking after our books for a long time, and thank you, Val. And so she said she's done, like nobody's brought any books back, and we still have lots of books out there. So I'm so happy because that means people are reading them, but you need to bring them back. Um, some of the books are about human trafficking and the things that uh, the Nazarene churches are doing with that. Some of them are biographies of people that have gone like to India and have, have uh, spent their time in the mission field there. Talking about missionaries, I guess that's why I'm always up here. Um, we have a missionary coming next Saturday night. So put an hour aside, it'll be worth it. His name is Enoch T. He's a young lad. Uh, he's in his early 30s, maybe even 28. Um, he's been working in the Philippines for this part of his uh, beginning of his ministry. And now he's been um, sent to another field, and I believe it's a creative access area, which um, they're changing the name a little bit now. I think it's called sensitive area or something like that. So he's going to be here showing um, video on his work, and that's the way they raise some of the way they raise their money and let us know how to pray for him. So that's going to be an exciting evening. It's not going to be long, so you can carry on with the rest of your Saturday plans. But 6.30 this coming Saturday here. So please put that in your, your notes. Um, I think that's it. Oh, if anybody is going to Kelowna Saturday afternoon, he flies into the airport at about 2 Saturday, and he needs to get here to uh, Penticton. Now, now, we can do it, but if anybody's going up there shopping to Costco or something like that um, and can bring him back, that would be great. Thank you. Before you head, uh, I know this morning you came and asked uh, for a prayer request um, for your brother. Um, and you said he's headed to the hospital this morning. Uh, what exactly is going on? Or just um, well, my brother John Stark. Many of you people um, have known oh, him. Uh, the Stark family has been involved with this church since 1993. I think that we moved here. And so my brother John and his wife actually were um, working with the youth at that time when they were here. And um, so just over the last two months, he's lost a lot of weight. Um, he's deteriorated. Uh, they didn't know why. They thought it was his heart. And then they found that he's got a big tumor behind his stomach, about a foot long. And they were praying and thinking that they could operate. But now he's fallen at home. And so they're just taking him to hospital now. Um, we're not really sure what the outcome will be of that. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, I'm going to lay hands on Barb and pray specifically for, and you said John? John. Yeah. John Stark. All right. If you guys will bow your heads, let us pray this morning. Yeah. Lord, we think of John this morning and just the pain and discomfort. Uh, we know that uh, there's a tumor inside of his body that doesn't belong. Uh, Lord, uh, things are uncertain, uh, but Lord, uh, we've seen you work miracles in the uncertain, uh, in the impossible, and so Lord, we're trusting you. Be in that room, be at the hospital. We know you've gone before him. Bring comfort to the family, touch his body, give wisdom and clarity to nurses and doctors and all medical staff, uh, but Lord, we need a healing for him. Lord, you are our only hope. May we trust in you and glorify you on behalf of John. Lord, be with Barb as she uh, has concern for her brother. Uh, just comfort her, give her peace, and let her be assured that you are good, even despite the circumstances. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And church, if you'll find a posture of prayer this morning that...
as we go to the Lord. Uh, we've got a number of requests uh, from the rest of our congregation and uh, family. Uh, and so if you, if you need to come down to the altars, uh, they're a great uh, space to be. Um, maybe we need to wear the tops of them out a little more. Uh, there's no shame in going there. That's not what those places are about. It's about an opportunity and a movement uh, to move to the throne room of God, to encounter him in a different space. And so if you'll bow your heads, if you'll find that posture of prayer this morning, let us pray. Lord, thank you for bringing each one of us together to worship you as a corporate body, to lift your name on high as you are so worthy of our praise. And Lord, I pray this morning for all of us that have worries and concerns that weigh us down, that leave us heavy laden. Lord, some of that might be financial concerns. Some of it may be relationships that are strained. And Lord, for a lot of us, it may be these bodies who sometimes let us down. Lord, I pray for Peter this morning as he continues to recover, continue to give him strength, continue to fill his lungs with breath and open them wide and strengthen those muscles. Lord, I pray for Simon this morning as uh, he's got an appointment this week and looking for answers. Uh, may that go smoothly. May there be clarity on the picture. May there be an understanding of, of what's going on. And Lord, I pray for all the others who... I just need a healing touch. I would like answers for the things that ail them. Bring the right doctors, nurses into the, their path. And Lord, I pray for the Filipino family this morning as we celebrated Edna's life yesterday. We're so thankful that she's joined the chorus praising you. What a voice to add. But Lord, here we are with an empty seat in our midst. And so, Lord, we just pray for the family as they continue to mourn, as they continue to move forward into new days, that memories will hold fast to them and bring smiles and comfort. And Lord, I pray for our community, uh, for Penticton for the surrounding areas, uh, for British Columbia, and up into the Yukon for our district. But Lord, I, I know that we are a global church. And so Lord, I just want to pray for all our brothers and sisters who gathered today around the world, no matter the circumstances, that you were brought glory. And Lord, I pray for each work that each church is doing. You've created us, you've made us, you've brought us together. We're all unique. But you've given us a task and a responsibility to build your kingdom here. We want to be active in that work as we see you in breaking into such a broken world and setting things right. So let us be kingdom builders, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as Dale said, we, uh, we're going to be on grace for a little bit. Last Thursday, we had our first session that really covered a chapter of the book, not just the introduction, and uh, talked about amazing grace. And, and the, really the focus that came out of that was this emphasis that God's grace was really borne out in the person of Jesus Christ and the way that we uh, can receive God. Uh, restoration in him and that this person of Jesus is the one who guides and directs and allows us to uh, move forward in a life worthy of the calling of God over the next five weeks four weeks five I don't know the next few weeks we're going to look at how this grace is 
manifest or how it presents itself. How do we understand it? We as human beings have some, uh, we're limited by the words that we can use. And so we're going to see how is grace available in our life and how do we interact with God in such a way. And so this morning, uh, we are going to look at something that is, uh, you know, and I don't, I must have uploaded the wrong one because that's supposed to say sneaky. So I, I uploaded the wrong one. That's my fault. Jeannie, that is not on you. That's all me. So sneaky grace. For sin that says sneaky grace. Uh, but another word for this sneaky grace is prevenient grace. Chuck, you must have read the book. But John Wesley is... Uh, he wasn't the first one to come up with provenient grace, but he did a lot of work in that provenient grace space. And if you think about the word pre, what does that tell you? It's the one before, the one that goes before. Provenient grace is the grace that's moving out into the world before we ever show up to the party. So often we use words like, oh, when I found Jesus... Or, you know, oh, their story's great. You know, when they found Jesus. Well, I think we limit God and God's grace in that moment because we're forgetting that, well, God's already gone before. He's already working. He's already moving. And so, yes, we have, our eyes have been opened to what he's done and we have found him in that way. But uh, let's not put God in that box because he's so much more than that and he is moving. And so if you look in Scripture... There's lots of evidence of God working before. And if you want to go ahead and get ready, we're gonna, it's going to be a couple minutes before we get to it. We are going to read some scripture today. And when I say we're going to read some scripture today, we are going to read some scripture. So if you want to turn to Acts 10, I know I've spoiled you and you've gotten used to, you know, a few verses here and there. I think we're going 47 deep today. It's a beautiful story, and I think it has to be read in one setting. And so we'll get there. But there's some other evidence of, of this grace that goes before. Uh, one of my favorite things is to, to think about God existing before. Go all the way back to Genesis. What's the first thing God does? He starts to create, right? Starts to pull uh, the chaos that exists into order. God's grace is found in that. And we were created in the image of God. God gave grace to each one of us in that moment. But throughout Scripture, we see that God has been working before, and we trust that God will finish that work. Uh, yesterday at Edna's service, and I actually hadn't uh, remembered that this was in the chapter of uh, the text that we're reading, but I had, I had looked at it and I talked to the family, and uh, we were going to talk about God doing a good work in us and seeing it through to completion. Well, out of Philippians, uh, you know, Paul says, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So who started that work? God. And who's going to bring it through to completion? Jesus. God. is going to. His grace is going to move us through there. And so uh, think about Abram. God approaches this guy. He says, hey, got something for you. I want you to move all the way over there sight unseen, and I'm going to make you a great nation. God approaches you, says, hey, I want you to go over there sight unseen, and I'm going to make you a great nation. Now pretend you don't know who God is. Are you going? Probably not, maybe. I don't know, I'd be hesitant. But God approaches Abram, God's working before, and says, hey, I need you to do this. He initiated that call with him. Uh, but then we think of maybe in the New Testament, the writer of that Philippians letter. Well, did he uh, like the grace and the person of Jesus? No. What was Saul's method of operation? Persecution of who? Christians, the church. He didn't like them. He didn't want them. But what happened on that road to Damascus? His eyes were opened by who? Jesus, the, the physical presence of Jesus, the grace embodied of God. 
Jesus approached him, God went before and began a good work in Paul. But then we can even think about uh, others, maybe in your own life. If you think back, some of us have uh, had a conversion experience a few years ago, and you, you look at moments before you were saved, you look at moments before you committed to the Lord, and you say, man, I think God was working in that moment, but you weren't aware of it. Enoch's headed to a creative access. I honestly don't know what we're calling them now, but I have heard something along those same lines. It's amazing how the work in those areas thrives. Creative access is ones where a uh, Christian church would be persecuted if you were uh, openly out and talking about it. Uh, for instance, typically China is known as a creative access country. However, uh, there's a lot of good work for Christ's church being done there. Christ has gone before. We could show up and go, hey, uh, we, we've got this guy, Jesus. And they're like, yeah, we know. He's here. God's been working. Uh, but one of the best examples of provenient grace in Scripture is the story of Cornelius. Is that ringing any bells? It's going to be Acts 10. Like I said, we're going to get through it. I'll, I'll probably pause a few times uh, and give some notes. But this is a story that I think should be read in one setting. A story that shows how God works and His grace goes before. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. Think about that. Um, He's a Roman, right? He's, he's not one of those Christ followers. But it says he acknowledges who God is, and he's, he's one of those Gentiles. Yet, he's a God-fearing man. And then this happens. One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel had spoken to him and left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it there were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. And then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again, a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now Peter, oh, we understand that he comes from a Jewish background. He is, he is a Christ follower, he's a disciple uh, but he's still very Jewish in some of his thinking. And so the law was important to him. The law was put in place to give boundaries, to give uh, an expectation on how to worship God. And so the law means something to Peter. And so this, to hear this, and he's thinking about eating unclean things or uh, how that would just make him dirty, I think it puts him in some distress because it continues on and says, now while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of this vision he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared and they were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, 
Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and, falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up! I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? So here we are. We've got Peter stepping out of his comfort zone. Right? He, he's pretty staunch in his understanding that I'm a Jew. Well, we've got Christ, and I'm still trying to figure out what, what does this Christ mean to me? What do I, how do I understand him? But he's, he's kind of got his uh, foot in, or his stake in the ground, and he's not moving. But as he approaches Cornelius and he starts to see this group assembled, his eyes are open to the vision, the trance that he just had, that God wasn't talking about eating food. He was talking about human beings. He was talking about the Gentiles, those who are different than me. And then Cornelius replied and he said, Four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. Therefore I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. So here we have Cornelius, a man who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't know God, and, and by all early accounts, shouldn't. That's the expectation that this uh, Gentile should have no uh, knowledge of who God is. Uh, but God's been working in his life, and God appears to him through an angel. And this gentleman is obedient in recognizing the Lord and sending for this Simon Staying with another Simon, which I would have gotten confused back then. But Peter's got a responsibility too. Peter shows up, and his tune has to change a little bit. Uh, because we've got Cornelius asking, hey, I need you to preach now. But Peter's having to show up and go, you know what? I think God's been working here long before I ever got here. And I think sometimes that's what we forget. Because we're going to go, man, if I go out there, I'm going it alone and I better bring the Lord along with me. No, we've missed the mark that wherever we go, God is already working. He's already been doing. His grace has already permeated the situation. And and we can go and say, ah, God must not be in this place. But then we would be lying. Because God is in that place. And so we have to be uh, aware of that responsibility to recognize that God is working. So Peter does preach. He began to speak to them. He says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, 
how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So here's Peter preaching. I think some things are starting to click for him. He's, he's preached in uh, early on in Acts uh, where uh, he spoke and many people heard in their own native tongue. Uh, he's used to preaching. But I think clarity is finally starting to click for Peter. Uh, that the image bearer of God is all humanity. That video we watched earlier of a young man growing up in Rwanda, and if you've never, if you don't know much about that story, go do some research. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of documentaries out there that really give you clarity on, on the depravity of humans and our understanding. And that young man, I hated humanity. It wasn't just those people. He hated all humanity. But in opening a small box and receiving a gift with a note that says, I love you, began to change and soften his heart. Now I ask you, do you think God was moving before him? I do. I think God was there and and I think for Peter, he's starting to see that Cornelius and all these others that have assembled, God's been working in their life, and now he's at the opportunity to preach to them. And so while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. So here we have Peter. We have Peter getting it. He's starting to see that God's working. He's starting to see others, uh, that God shows no partiality. That God doesn't see uh, anything about us except that we were created in his image. But Peter was a human, right? Peter was somebody who tried Jesus' patience. Can you guys think of some situations as we read through the Gospels about Peter and Jesus? uh, And... Uh, Peter was a little bit gung-ho on some things. He wanted to get it done. Maybe chopped somebody's ear off. Didn't quite understand what Jesus was trying to get to. And so Peter, in this moment, is seeing exactly what God desires. That we go preach to people who have been ministered to through God's prevenient grace. No matter the situation, no matter who they are. But... Later on, uh, Peter starts interacting with Paul, and we see some, oh, oh yeah, well, they probably need to be circumcised. And his Jewishness starts to come again, and it starts to, to bear itself again. And so his humanness starts to rear its head. I think sometimes we put uh, the, the characters of the Bible, these ones that uh, we have these amazing stories of up on a pedestal that... Uh, But Peter was kind enough to tell us that, stand up, I'm just a mortal. That God's the one that's going to be doing work because I will let him down. Uh, But we have a responsibility with God's prevenient grace. So maybe there's somebody in your life, one of the things we're doing on Thursday night is is thinking about those people who uh, are not walking with the Lord, who have not committed themselves, who have not made a choice, or maybe uh, they were aware of God's grace and they've chosen to say, no, thank you, and move a different direction. 
we're thinking about those people because I'm still trusting that God's grace is working in their life. And that at the right time, in God's time, and we, each one of us, and us as a church, will be used to speak into their life. But we're trusting that God's provenient grace is doing it. I had to write a paper in college about an unreached people group in Brazil. And this unreached people group uh, was, uh, missionaries went down, this was a class called cultural anthropology. And if you don't know anything, anthropologists and missionaries usually don't get along. Uh, anthropologists want to go and see a culture, understand a culture, and leave said culture alone. Whereas a missionary, we desire to bring the good news of the gospel, which typically is going to alter a culture. Uh, but this missionary went in and met with this unreached people group, and in that situation, it starts talking about Jesus. And as he described who Jesus was, and, and using uh, the best translation they could, it took time, uh, they begin to go, we know this man. We know who this man is. We've seen him in our dreams, but we didn't know his name. And now we know his name. What do we call that? Provenient grace. That's gone before, prepared hearts so that we come and say, hey, there's this guy named Jesus who's good and he's perfect and he desires to walk with you. People will receive him, not because of what we did but because of the work that God began in their life. But we have that responsibility to recognize it, put aside any prejudice, put aside any questions of God, and go and do. Is that fair, church? I'm going to ask you to do something this week. I want you to think about in your past... Somewhere before uh, salvation, before you were aware of God, for some of us, that's a little harder uh, in the sense that maybe we were born into it. Uh, but maybe those moments where you saw God working, where you weren't aware. And I think for some of us, it's a little harder to recognize that even now because, well, we're pretty comfortable. If we're honest, our bank account's where it needs to be. Got some health insurance. I don't, I don't have to rely too much on God for my sustenance. That form of grace. You know, so I think for some of us it's harder. You, you think about uh, where the gospel grows most rapidly. Where is it? In places where people are desperate. Uh, but we have a responsibility to help make those places non-existent. Although Jesus was pretty firm with us that the poor will always be here. So we will always have a responsibility. Uh, but think about this week where God worked and you weren't aware of it. You didn't see it. Uh, but then I want you to try to have a conversation with one person this week. Believer or unbeliever. Um, and just ask them. Do you remember a time when God worked in your life? And you weren't aware of it. You, you didn't see it maybe until after the fact where God was working. Have a spiritual conversation this week about God's provenient grace. How many of you are uncomfortable with that? Yeah, there's one. Thank you for being honest. It is. It's uncomfortable. But here's the thing. The more you have these conversations, and, and so last Thursday... Uh, we had to be a little vulnerable and talk about ourselves and our walk and the way that God's used. And I discovered some things about some of y'all. I did. It shocked me. I went, whoa. <laughs> but guess what? God's good because he didn't leave you there. His grace brought you through. And so as we have these spiritual conversations, yes, they're uncomfortable. <laughs> it makes us tense up and maybe that knot comes in your stomach. But guess what? The more you do it, the easier it'll get. And so think about God's provenient grace this week. Think about how you can 
be a witness to it, interact with it, and have a spiritual conversation. Can you do that this week, church? Can you do that this week, church? All right, thank you. All right, if you'll bow your heads, let us pray this morning. Lord, your grace is so good. We've we've seen evidence of it as it's moved uh, throughout this world for millennia. And Lord, we trust that you are still working. We see this story of Cornelius and a man who didn't know you as Lord and Savior, didn't know Jesus Christ. But you came to him, you spoke to him, you prepared his heart. And Lord, then you spoke to a man who walked daily with you for years. And you said, I need you, Peter. And so, Lord, I pray that as we go this week, that you'll say to each one of us, I need you. Give us the opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with someone. Let us reflect, bring to mind those moments that you worked without our knowledge, Lord, that we can see your hand, your grace rising up in our life. And Lord, give us boldness as those individuals come across our paths to say, how's God worked in your life? Have you ever seen where God was moving where you maybe weren't even aware of it. Lord, give us the boldness to ask that. May we commit to that this week. Uh, but Lord, may, mostly may we just each and every day wake up ready to walk in your goodness and your grace. Lord, may we be encouraged. May we find hope today that you go before us always and forever. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.